Okay. See, it seems to be fine. I mean, I'm recording. It seems to be fine. Uh, I still need to post the recording for last lecture. Um, I meant to do that this morning, but I'm still having trouble logging into uh, to Blackboard on Chrome. I can do it on Windows, but for some reason I can't log in using Chrome. But anyway, um, I'll post that pretty quick. Um, today, I want to just re review arguments and hopefully uh, go over um, a little bit, go over relativism. And in fact, maybe we can kind of like, what we'll do is we'll, um, since we're short on time and we're starting it rather late, uh, we can kind of kill two birds with one stone and I'll cover relativism. And while I'm doing it, I'll be giving you arguments or at least some typical arguments for relativism. So um, the term relativism, um, it can be used in a much more broad context, but in this class, we're obviously talking about ethics. It'll be moral relativism. Hold on a second. Let me turn my fan on here. All of a sudden, it's getting kind of hot. All right. Anyway, um, so I'll explain what relativism is in general, and then I'll talk about moral relativism specifically. But let's just review real quickly um, what an argument is and uh, how you determine whether or not you, you have a good one. You know, so that was sort of the subject last class we were looking. We, we, we also talked about all the different um, types of ethics. Right? We talked about, uh, you know, this class particularly, we're gonna be looking at, or primarily looking at ethics from a practical or applied standpoint. But then there's, the, the, there's also meta-ethics and normative ethics, which we will be doing excuse me, I keep like hiccuping. We will be doing a little bit of meta, meta ethics and we'll be doing a little bit of normative ethics uh, in this class, but we're gonna try to keep it as practical and as applied as possible. And so, but the first couple of weeks, I guess, and particularly today, we'll be doing a lot of normative and I, I guess relativism, you, you, could, you could argue relativism is not really a normative ethical theory. It, it's a meta ethical theory. Um, it basically says that you can't come up with a norm, uh, right? There are no norms. There are no norms in ethics and they're all just relative. And so, but we'll talk about that in a minute, but just to review what an argument is and to distinguish, to distinguish an argument from, you know, what, what I would call it a disagreement. So, you know, you've got the example I gave last time, I think, was maybe not the greatest example, but the boyfriend and girlfriend having an argument. And if one of them is just saying one thing and the other one is denying it, then that's not really an argument yet, right? So if the girl's like, you don't love me, you don't care about me, and the boyfriend says, yes, I do, then we don't have an argument quite yet. An argument is always going to involve uh, some premises, um, or at least one premise. You're going to have some reason to back up the claim that you're making. So I think I gave the example, the guy could say, um, you know, I called you every night when I was out of town. Um, I took you out on our anniversary. I remembered your birthday and I bought you a thoughtful present. All these could be premises for his assertion that he loves her. Um, what we're looking at when we look at arguments here is we want to know whether or not they're good. And the way we determine that is uh, two things. We want to know if the argument is valid and we want to know if the argument is sound. And so we, we covered this briefly at the end of class last time, but let's review. Uh, what does it mean to be valid? Well, essentially what that means is that there's actually a connection between the premises and the conclusion such that if the premises were true, the conclusion would have to follow. It would necessarily follow. And we got to a little bit of a debate of whether or not this guy's argument was valid. I would say it's not because it's possible that he did all those things and still doesn't love her. They, they might be good signs or they make it probable that he loves her, but they don't guarantee. They're not a necessary guarantee of the conclusion. And so uh, the premises don't necessarily uh, entail the conclusion. But even if, the, even if he had a valid argument, that's still not enough because remember, we're also looking for soundness. And so this is where um, we look at the actual premises. Not only uh, a sound argument 
is not only valid, right? Not only, not only do the premises establish the conclusion, but also all the premises are true. So if you have a false premise, you don't have a good argument. If you're using a, a false premise to support your conclusion, then a false premise doesn't support anything because it's false. So if the guy says, I, you know, I, I took you out on our anniversary, I called you every night, and she says, no, you didn't. You didn't call me every night. You called me like once the whole time you were gone, and you didn't remember my birthday. You just remembered it because the Facebook notification reminded you it was my birthday. And, and so, so if he's lying, and he, even if he has a valid argument, a false premise is going to destroy that. So, so these are the kind of things we're looking for when we're doing the readings uh, in this class, and we're looking at the arguments. These are the kind of things we want to, 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 to ask ourselves. We want to ask ourselves, well, well, first of all, we, have, we need to know what the freaking argument is. And sometimes it's not quite obvious. You know, you read some of these, these readings are pretty difficult. Um, so sometimes you just have to figure out, well, what the heck is this philosopher trying to argue? What is their conclusion and how do they establish it? What sort of evidence, what sort of reasoning do they provide to establish the conclusion? And once you're clear about that or relatively clear about the argument, then you want to say, well, does it work, right? Do the premises really establish the conclusion? And, and when it comes to that question, usually these philosophers are pretty good about validity. That's, that's usually something that's not so controversial. Every once in a while, you'll find a stinky argument, you know, that, that seeps through the cracks. And you'll be like, wait a minute, that doesn't even follow. Like, even if this were true, that wouldn't follow. Um, but usually they're pretty good. You know, they wouldn't be famous philosophers and getting published if they were coming up with all these invalid arguments. But a soundness argument, right? Like whether an argument's sound, whether the premises are true, this is something that is a little bit more controversial. And this is something where you actually might, uh, we, we, in our in-class debates, we might actually differ. We, we might have a difference of opinion about whether an argument is sound or not based on whether or not the evidence is true or false. So uh, are the premises, the, the reasoning is true or false. So, so for instance, let me give you an example of, uh, and I think I might have actually used this example last time at the end of class, but um, I think it's, a, it's kind of straightforward and a simple uh, example of what I'm talking about. But this is what I call like kind of the typical uh, pro-life or, or, or maybe even more accurate anti-abortion argument. And what does it look like? I don't think I wrote it out last time, but um, I think I might have just sort of said it. So it, you know, it's basically, I would say, you know, most people, or at least a lot of people who oppose or against abortion, uh, generally they have this view of it. And, and they might not like sit down and write this argument on a piece of paper, but typically the reason that they oppose abortion is because of this. So the conclusion they're trying to draw is that uh, abortion is immoral, right, or wrong, or however you want to put it. And what they're thinking is, well, wait a minute. Murder is Im immoral. That would be like the first premise. The second premise, abortion is murder. And so therefore, we can conclude that abortion is immoral. Now, this argument, let me make the font a little bigger here. Um, this is actually a valid argument. Um, so I'm not saying that it proves that abortion is immoral. Like you might disagree with the, the conclusion, but the point is if these premises were true, um, then the conclusion would follow, right? If murder is immoral and abortion is murder, then it would also be immoral. Okay. So it would follow, okay. By extension, but this is where it gets controversial. When we, when we ask whether or not it's sound, then we have to look at the premises. We have to look at what, what does this one say? Well, I think the first premise is pretty non-controversial. Most people would say murder is immoral. Is there anybody in here that, that, that disagrees with the first premise? I want to know who you are so I can maybe like, you know, hide out from you. But uh, I think most people, especially, you know, depending on how you define murder, but if it's just killing somebody for the heck of it, um, you know, or because, you know, you like to kill or whatever, because you're angry. Most people would oppose that. The second premise, though, I think might be more controversial. Some people might think it's true. Some people might think it's false. 
some people might think that, well, it depends on like what you mean. Like maybe like it's murder if it's the first trimester or it's after the first trimester, but before the first trimester, it's not. Or, you know, and then we get into things like metaphysics. We talked about metaphysics last time about like the nature of reality. Then we have to start defining what a person is and what gives a person value. And so this is where it gets controversial. V validity, when we talk about an argument being valid or not, that's tr it just is or it isn't. It's not something that's open for debate. Uh, this is stuff, stuff we established with logic. It's either logically connected or it isn't. But soundness, this is where, again, it gets a little bit more fuzzy. So, so when you go to the readings and you're looking at the arguments, the two things you're looking for, again, are, you know, is there a connection between the reasoning and the conclusion? And then also, well, are the reasons given true? Right. Do I, you know, I, you know may, maybe this person has a good argument, but I don't believe some of the reasons. I think that some of there, there's a false premise in there. Um, so that's the kind of critical thinking that I, I like to get you guys to develop in the course of the semester. Really, that's like to me, the main goal of the class is this sort of critical thinking skills. Now, um, moving on, let's look at we're going to look at a couple more arguments. I don't know if you can hear my cat, but she's really fat. She's already had enough food uh, today, so shut up. Anyway, so um, we're going to look at a couple arguments in support of moral relativism, but let's at least, let, let's kind of explore what, what is moral relativism. Um, it's the theory that basically says that there are, I mentioned this earlier, that there are no ethical norms, right? There are no, or at least there are no universal or objective ethical norms. You know, if you're talking about relativism in general, you know, that might be the idea that there are no objective truths. All truth is relative, that everything is subjective. That view relativism, I don't know if there's any philosopher that believes that. That's kind of a ridiculous view. You know, if you say that everything is relative, that, that nothing is true absolutely, and that it it's all depends on your subjective opinion and there's no truth, it's all subjective. Well, all you have to do to defeat that theory is point out that it that it's not consistent. Because you gotta say, well, wait a minute, you say that there's no absolute truth. Well, is that true? You're basically making a tr you're making a claim that there is no absolute truth. Is that claim true? Uh, and so there are some philosophers who accuse like some of these French theorists of being like absolute relativist and not. I just don't think they understand it. There's no philosopher out there that's going to say there's no truth because uh, they're not they're not dumb enough uh, to say that. But there are a few moral relativists. There are some who think that look when it comes to morality. There's really no such thing as an absolute right or wrong. It's not like mathematics where you just have a right answer. You know, a triangle, uh, you know, always has three sides. The angles on the inside, the interior angles always add up to 180 degrees. These are just true. They don't depend on your opinion. They don't depend on your culture, your upbringing. Um, they don't depend on the context. They're just always true. When it comes to morality, there are no truths like that. There are no math, you know, the way that there are mathematical truths or the way that there might be scientific truths about, you know, if you put water uh, into uh, an environment that is 32 degrees or below, it will freeze. That's just true. You can observe it, you can test it, but you can't test whether or not murder is wrong. You can't test whether or not abortion is wrong. And so ethics is just relative, okay? So I'm kind of curious, um, how many of you think of yourselves this way? Or do you, do you think that morality is a sort of just relative? Or do you think there are absolute truths in, in ethics just like there are in math? What do you think? You can, you can type in the, in the chat box, you know, what you think. Uh, what, what do you say? Is, is morality just subjective? It's just subjective or cultural or, or do you think it's, so Raven saying relative, Daniela relative. Yeah, usually that's the response. It's just relative. No, no objective. No one's gonna say it's objective. No one. Wow, not one. Well, it's a small class, so that's weird because um, at TSU, I had quite a lot more uh, 
students that said it was objective, but still I would say the, the, the vast majority were like you guys. It's just all relative, either to the culture or to the individual. I guess I should also uh, distinguish between two different types of relativism. There's probably the more popular of the two. There's cultural relativism. And then there's also uh, what I, I prefer to call it subjectivism. But also people might refer to it as subjective relativism. But I'm lazy, so I, the first word's shorter. I, I use that. But, but they're the same thing. And cultural relativism basically is the idea that when it comes to morality, when it comes to uh, what's considered right or wrong, that is always dependent upon your culture. It's always dependent upon uh, where you were raised, uh, the traditions in that culture. So murder is not right. Murder is not wrong. Uh, it's only wrong because society says it's wrong, you know, or, or whatever. So ultimately it's not. It's just, it's just convention. It's conventional. Uh, subjectivism, I guess you could argue, is the more extreme form of relativism, which says it's actually uh, depends on the person. It's not even a cultural thing because within cultures, some people might disagree. There might be some people who think this and, and they live in the same culture. So um, it's not even a, a cultural thing. It's an actually subjective thing. It's each person comes up with their own uh, morality. Okay, so those are the sort of varieties of, of relativism. And you might be surprised, or maybe not, maybe you're not, wouldn't be surprised to hear that the vast majority of philosophers, uh, at least the ones that we're going to be looking at this semester, and, and I would say in, in history, really up until maybe a hundred years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that, most of them were not relativists. And even today, you might argue that most of them aren't aren't relativist. If you look at academia, most philosophers reject relativism as a theory. They don't think it's a good theory. It's a horrible moral theory. If relativism is true, that means that murder is neither wrong nor right. And some of them think look, it's just obvious that killing someone is wrong. There's nothing good about it. But then they have to explain why, right? They have to come up with a good argument. And um, so we'll look at that, you know, when we get to, to, to talking about Aristotle and virtue ethics, we'll see what his answer is. And we'll look at a few different ethical theories this semester. But by and large, uh, the more popular ethical theories, at least in academia, in, you know, in, in, uh, in philosophy departments, is not relativism. In fact, if you're a relativist, you get a lot of shit. You get, a, like, you go to, you tell someone you're a relativist and they, they usually don't take you serious. Um, and, and why? Why not? There are some decent arguments for relativism. There are. But the typical reasons why people are relativists are usually not good. They're usually not very good arguments. So, you know, maybe before I give you some of these arguments, maybe somebody could chime in. Um, it looks like everybody that answered answered relative. Not one person said objective. Does anybody have like a why they believe that's true? What what reasoning, or you just believe it because you just believe it? What what why don't you think that there's a objective morality? What would lead you to believe that it's relative? You just believe that because you just believe it? <laughs> just so I'm understanding correctly. I'm sorry? I said just so, can you hear me? I have headphones in. I don't know if you can hear yeah, me. Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just so I'm understanding, could you explain what objective is again? So objective would be something that is true for everyone and true, it, you know, it, it's truth does not depend on opinion. It doesn't depend on my, my subjective feelings, my condition. So... For example, the fact that two plus two equals four is just true, right? It's not something that depends on me. The, f the fact that, um, the, like, like if you take a circle and you measure the ratio between the circumference and the diameter, the ratio is always the number pi. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on me, it depends on the, the properties of a circle. Right. Um, when you take a glass of, of water and you put it in a freezer that's 32 degrees and below, it freezes. That doesn't depend on me. That depends on the properties of water. It depends on the object itself. 
So the object determines the truth. Whereas something subjective, I determine the truth, uh, my culture determines it. It's not something that's just true. It's maybe a matter of convention. And so it seems like almost everybody here, maybe they don't quite understand it, but they seem to be saying that, that that's how ethics is. Ethics is not like math. It's not like science. It's something that's completely conventional, right? So there really is no right answer. It's just, it's only right because we say it is. Unlike, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well now, okay, I just want to make sure that I understood what you were saying. I put relativism because how you, what you were saying, you kind of already answered it. You said, oh, well, culture plays, if your culture can play into it, your upbringing can play into it. An example would be, well, let's see an example. Just like people like religion wise, that, that could be like a good example. I'm sure a lot of people say religion, use religion as an example. Um, like if you grow up in a foreign country, a lot of things are more strict over there and um, versus like over here in the States. So I would say like there's a lot of relativism to that. Like you're, we're not going to do the same thing. We're not going to morally think it's okay for your husband to like beat you versus like over there in a different country, that's morally okay for them. That's ethically okay because that's how their upbringing was. It's like the wife is like, is to answer to right. the man of the house versus over here in the States, it's a bit different. We, we frown upon that, but in other countries, they get praised for it. Right. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if like praise is the right word, but I, you're right. I mean, like if you go to like Russia, for instance, you know, it's sort of like if a woman goes to the police and says her husband beat her, they're not going to be like, that's horrible. Let's, let's go get them. They're going to be like, well, what did you do? Like, why, 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 why was he beating you? How did you misbehave? Like, like, like they see that as like, you must've done something wrong. They, they're going to take his side. And, and in fact, he has the right to do that, I guess is the idea is that, you know, he can beat her if he wants. Like that's his, you know, so you're, you're pointing out like, so you've got these two different cultures where one thing is absolutely seen as acceptable and where in another culture, it would be completely like, no, uh, that's wrong. You don't do that. And so to me, this is the most common reason I would say that people are relativist or, or tend to believe in relativism. Um, and maybe this is why relativism wasn't as popular a hundred years ago as it is today. Nobody was really a relativist back then. And I think I think the, 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 the thing is that people our age, like my age and younger, uh, maybe even a little older than me, um, the people that were born, you know, like within the last century, pretty much, or especially the last 20 or 30 years, because we're so exposed to other cultures, whereas, you know, if you were like, for instance, if you were a European growing up in the medieval period, you wouldn't be aware of other religions. Like you're talking about different religions and different cultures and a different country. And, and so they might, you know, if you go to India, the way that you treat a cow, right, is the sacred cow. And, you you know, you can eat lamb, but you're not supposed to eat beef and, 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 and things like this. Because we have such uh, experience with these things, we tend to believe that, uh, well, there must not be a right answer. It's all just conventional. And this was sort of a part of the reading. If y'all did the reading, it was, uh, what was the, uh, I guess I could like do a little pop quiz here. Uh, what was the reading about? It was, it was a short excerpt from Herodotus where the title of it was Custom is King. It was basically a cultural differences argument. They were talking about, uh, what's his name, Darius, who... Uh, he, he, he was uh, talking about this group. In fact, let me see, can I find that? I, I'm almost scared to like open another window. So let me actually see if I can find my textbook where I got this from. Where the hell is my, oh, here it is. So I'm gonna read part of it. It's pretty gruesome though. Like for those of you who read it, it's pretty gross. So I, I, I'm warning you, like you're talking about beating, beating a wife, you know, like that's, yeah, that's like, oh man, that's domestic abuse. That's okay. Yeah, but this is, this is kind of like, ugh, this is kind of gross. Okay. Uh, it appears certain to me, this is what Herodotus, the historian is writing by a great variety of proofs 
that Cambyses was raving mad. He would not else have set himself to make a mock of holy rituals and long established usages. For if one were to offer men to choose out of all the customs in the world, such as seem to them best, they would examine the whole number and end by preferring their own. So convinced they are that their own usages far surpass those of others. Unless therefore a man was mad, it is not likely that he would make sport of such matters. That people have this feeling about their laws may be seen by very many proofs, among others by the following. So here's sort of his proof that, that there is no right answer, it's all just custom. He says, Darius, after he'd got the kingdom, called into his presence certain Greeks who were at hand, and he asked them what he should pay them to eat the bodies of their fathers when they died. To which they answered that there was no such sum that would tempt them to do such a thing. He then sent for certain Indians of a race called Calatians, men who eat their fathers, and asked them while the Greeks stood by and knew by the help of an interpreter all that would he, what was said, he says, what should he give them to burn the bodies of their fathers after they died? The Indians exclaimed aloud and bade him forbear such language, such as men's want herein, herein, and Pindar was right in my judgment when he said custom is king over all. So Herodotus is like sort of telling us, you know, hey, don't insist that other people follow your views. It all depends on the culture. You've got this one culture that eats their dead and um, that's a part of their 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 funeral birth their 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 funeral rites. The Greeks thought that was disgusting. You know, they thought that that was disrespectful to the dead. And so, you know, he's like, "How much could I pay you to eat your father when he dies?" Like, nothing. I would never do that. There's no price. That's horrible. Okay. And the opposite is true of the other people. He's like, "What if I told you you couldn't? You had to burn him." They they were just as insistent about the opposite view, and. Um, I think that this way of thinking, even though I'm going to show you why it's not really a good argument, it doesn't really prove anything about relativism. Um, I'll explain why in a minute. I think it's coming from a place, at least if you read that passage, it's coming from a place of tolerance. You know, Herodotus is just saying, look, I've traveled, I've seen the world, um, I, I, I've written all these histories, and you just got to have to accept people. You've got to tolerate uh, other cultures, no matter how weird um, they seem. But even though I think that's definitely a good standard, I think, you know, being tolerant is, is generally a good thing. This might actually reveal the limits of certain values. In fact, you could maybe argue, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, and, and perhaps somebody, somebody could think of something that's a counterexample to this, but it seems like almost anything that's good has a limit to it. No matter how good it sounds, uh, it's not absolutely good. It can be taken to an extreme. Uh, and so even things like tolerance, tolerating other cultures, uh, good, I would say, good. But being, there might be such a thing as being too tolerant, being overly tolerant. So like, like for instance, imagine that you had a culture and your only value in that culture was to tolerate other cultures. And so it's like, okay, our culture is based on tolerating other cultures. No matter what their culture, we're gonna tolerate them. Well, what happens if another culture moves in and their culture is murdering and destroying every other culture besides their own? Are you supposed to tolerate that? I guess if you're going to be consistent, you'd have to tolerate the mass murder of your own culture because, you know, far be it from you to judge them for wanting to murder you, right? So, so, so again, it's, you know, it seems like, okay, yeah, be tolerant, but tolerate murder and, and destruction. I, you know, I mean, we have to be very specific here. So you're going to find that almost every theory we cover this semester, I would say every theory, not just almost, every theory has its flaws. Every norm has its flaws. Uh, you know, maybe some of them are better than others, but you know, when we start thinking about how we apply these to different cases, um, you're always going to find some some shortcomings. 
Well, what's wrong with this argument that we get in Herodotus? What's wrong with what we call the cultural differences argument, right? You mentioned, uh, I think it was Raven was talking about um, how in some cultures, domestic abuse is acceptable and in other cultures, most cultures like developed nations, um, domestic abuse is frowned upon. So you know, we could just use that as an example, right? We could say like, you know, in some cultures, domestic abuse, and I'm just using that as an example. We could plug in a lot of things. I think at my TSU class that the, the, uh, this young lady mentioned how in some cultures, polygamy, right? Having multiple wives or, or, or that's okay, or arranged marriages. There's all sorts of cultural practices that you could point to. Um, but basically the, the, the argument says something like this. In some cultures, domestic abuse, for instance, is considered acceptable. And the second premise, uh, in, in some cultures, domestic abuse is considered morally unacceptable. So therefore, our conclusion it's spell conclusion, right? Our conclusion is that it's neither right nor wrong, right? Domestic abuse is neither moral nor immoral. Right. Like beating your wife, it's like just you're just beating your wife. Like it's you know, if you go to Russia, it's OK. You go to America, it's not OK. Right. Uh, but it's just there's no right answer. Right. It depends on the conditions, depends on that. There's no objective answer. <clears throat> now, what's the problem with this argument? Remember, the, 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 two, the two things that we're looking for when we're, when we're looking at an argument, we're trying to determine whether it's a good or bad argument. First, we want to know, is it valid? So in other words, do the premises actually establish the conclusion? Then we want to look at the, the soundness of it. Are the premises true? Now, the premises are true. You know, I think Raven, you're right. There are some cultures where it's like acceptable. Like people don't, they don't see it. Like, yeah, the guy beat his wife. So what? It's his wife. He does what he wants with her. Um, and in some cultures, it, it obviously, like the one we live in now, it's not cool, right? You go to jail for it. You get a lot of trouble. You become a social pariah. No one wants to be your friend if they find out you're a wife beater, right? Um, so therefore, our conclusion that we draw from this is that it's there's just no right answer, right? It's just convention. Now, why is this not valid? I said it's. it's I said it. You know, the, the, even though the the premises are true, it's not a valid argument. Why not? Well. The premises, all they're talking about, they're making a claim about a particular belief, a particular culture's belief, what people happen to believe, right? In some cultures, uh, it's believed that there's nothing wrong with domestic abuse under certain conditions, I guess, right? I, I guess there might be extremes, but like in Russia, by and large, it's accepted. Especially if you go to like the rural, rural areas, maybe not like Moscow or St. Petersburg, right? But in other cultures, obviously, it's, it's, it's horrible. We're talking about a cultural belief. We're not talking about what's absolutely true. So, um, and isn't it possible that people believe things that aren't true? So the conclusion is not talking about what people believe. The conclusion is making a claim about what's right or wrong. And those can always be different things. And I think the fact that, you know, the, the fact that we're talking about ethics is what makes it so confusing and what makes it so, I guess, intuitive and people want to accept that it's valid when it really isn't. But if you think of, if you try to use this same logic on anything else, it's pretty obvious that it doesn't work. If you try to say something like, well, in some cultures, they believe that the earth is flat. And in other cultures, they think that the world is round. Therefore, the earth doesn't even have a shape at all. There's no right answer. 
because they because people disagree and they have different beliefs there's no right answer it just, it's just a relative that doesn't follow you know just because you know one culture believes that um water freezes at 38 and below and another culture believes that it freezes at 20 and below like neither one of them are right there is a right answer okay this doesn't prove the opposite though, right? All it shows is that relativism isn't obviously the right answer. Just because people have a difference of opinion, just because one culture thinks that a certain practice is moral and another culture thinks it's immoral, that doesn't mean there isn't a right answer just because there's a disagreement. So the fact that people differ isn't enough to prove that there's no way to settle the debate. Maybe there isn't, maybe relativism is, a, is correct, but this is not a good enough argument to establish it, right? Simply pointing out cultural differences is not enough to, to prove. I mean, unless you're like, like I know that some like anthropologists and sociologists, um, they use this term relativism in a little bit of different way as more of a descriptive theory. And so it's like, if you're just saying that, well, people, you know, cultural relativism is the view that people have different views and cultures are different. Well, obviously that's true. But in philosophy, we're trying to get to a right answer. Is there a right answer? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But just the fact that people haven't settled the debate doesn't mean there's no right answer. Another argument that you get, and this is the last argument, I, I think we're, we're probably gonna run out of time pretty quick here. It's already five after 11. So let me try to get through this one real quick. We might have to review this a little bit at the beginning next time. But another argument you hear against moral objectivism um, and in favor of moral relativism is the idea that because you can't really prove ethical statements the way you prove mathematical uh, statements or the way you prove scientific statements, there's no way to prove them. And so therefore there are none, there are no ethical truths. So, uh, or at least there are no objective ethical truths. So basically the argument is structured something like this. It says, if there are, objective moral truths, then we should be able to prove them. Okay, so that's the first premise. Right, if there are truths that are objective about morality, we should be able to prove them, just like we prove uh, scientific objective truths, you know, about gravity and, 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 and elasticity and all these other scientific things. But, right, we are not able to prove them. We are not able to prove moral truths. So therefore, we can conclude there are no Now you could you could actually argue that or, or you, you know you could make the point that this argument is actually a little bit better uh, than the last argument. And why do I say that? Because it is valid. It's actually a valid argument. If you look at the structure of the argument, the first premise is sort of like it's this form: if A, then B. Right. And the second premise is basically a denial of B. And the conclusion, all it is, is a denial of A. Right. So if you, if you use like the capital letter A to sort of, I guess, stand for this whole, set, this whole uh, proposition here, there are objective moral truths and you use the capital letter B to stand for the second half, right? We should be able to prove uh, objective moral truths. Then this is the way it would look. This is the structure. In fact, if you ever take a class in logic, that's like half the semester, all you do is you break down arguments like this. You look at the argument and you translate them into symbols, 
So you can kind of look at the structure. And if you look at the structure of this argument, I think it's a little bit more obvious why it's valid. If you, you, know, you know that, look, if these two things are true, the conclusion would actually have to follow. There is a logical connection. It doesn't even matter what A and B stand for. That's why validity is not so controversial. It's, it's very mathematical. We're talking about validity it has to do with the relationship between the claims being made. It has nothing to do with the claims themselves. It's how they relate to each other. So you have any if then statement. If you say if A then B, combined with the, with, with the denial of the second part, then you can always conclude the denial of the first part. So, I mean, this is maybe confusing the way I'm saying it, but if you just plug anything in and just think about it, right? If it, let's say um, if A stood for it's raining outside and B stood for the ground is wet, right? If it's raining outside, then the ground will be wet. The ground is not wet, therefore it's not raining outside. So this is actually, like I said, it's a valid argument. If the premises were true, the conclusion would have to follow. But now we have to ask, are the premises true? Is it sound? And I would say, I would argue that the first premise is definitely not true. The second premise is debatable. But the first premise, I would say for sure, is false. What the first premise is doing is it's basically assuming that anything that's true, anything that's true, must be provable. Isn't it possible, though, that there's something that's true that we can't prove? Can y'all maybe think of an example of something that could be true that's not provable? It's kind of a tough one. I can only think of a couple examples, but maybe if I thought harder, I could... Like, look, wh whether or not you're religious, someone mentioned religion earlier, um, either there's a God or there isn't, right? Either there is a God or there's not. So the statement that God exists is either true or false, okay? Can we prove it? I don't know, maybe that's a bad one because some philosophers think you can, right? There's a few philosophers that think that you can provide a proof for God's existence, but that's pretty controversial. But even if you couldn't, like even if you couldn't prove it, there would still be a there would still be something true. Either either God exists or God doesn't exist. Um, let's say there's a uh, there's a star that exists that is a billion light years away and we can't see it. Okay? It exists but we can't see it. it there's something true about it, but we couldn't prove it. So this idea that if um, if something is if there's something that's true about anything, it must be able to be proven. I think is a false assumption. There might be a lot of things in the universe that humans, at least human beings, will never be able to prove or never be able to know because we just don't have access to it. Maybe um, our mind is not capable of understanding it. Maybe our senses are unable of seeing it. You know, we only have a certain light spectrum. We only have a certain sound spectrum. And so maybe there, there's a lot of things about the universe and this could apply to ethics. Maybe there is something true about right and wrong and we just don't have access to it. There's no way we can ever prove it, but it's still true. Now, some people attack the second premise, and I think that that's a little bit more difficult to do because you're what you're doing here, and you, if you're attacking this argument, you're basically attacking a relativist, and so you have to convince a relativist that they're wrong. And I've heard a few arguments that um, sort of attack that second premise, but I don't think they do it in a way that would satisfy a, a hardcore relativist. So, but let me give you an example of some of the arguments that I've heard. Uh, there was a guy named James Rachels, um, and he he uh, he was a pretty popular. I don't know if popular is the right word. He's pretty successful ethics professor. He died maybe like five or ten years ago, and he makes this argument that actually the second premise is false, and that we actually are able to prove at least some things about ethics objectively. 
I mean, he admits that there are other things that are more controversial. When we talk about things like the things that we're going to be focusing on in this class, like the abortion debate and, uh, you know, uh, gun rights and things like this, those are more controversial. But when we look at other things, there's some things that are just obviously uh, either right or they're just obviously wrong. And the example he gives, and this is where I'll, I'll end the class with this example, um, he says, you know, imagine you have a professor who is teaching a class in ethics, like this class. And all semester you study the material and you get to class on the day of the final exam. And the professor says, you know, I know I gave you all a review on all this material and ethics, but I decided instead I'm going to test you on calculus and I'm going to make you do a calculus exam. Yeah, I, I love the expression on Chris's face. Yeah, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, like, and then he passes out a calculus exam and everyone fails it. Everyone in the class fails the exam and they're, they all fail the class. Um, does anybody here think that that would be fair? I don't think it would be fair. That was like, what a dick, you know? Um, and so James Rachel says, well, fairness is an ethical ideal. It's an ethical principle. And so obviously it's, it's obvious, no one would argue that what he did was fair. And so therefore we can prove some uh, moral truths objectively. Not like some are controversial, but some are pretty obvious. So the second premise actually is false. Well, why did I say that's not really that good of an argument? Um, especially if you're, if you're a relativist and he's trying to attack you. If you're a hardcore relativist, you could say, well, yeah, it's not fair, but who cares about fairness? Nothing really matters. There is no ethical truth. And like, he's a professor, he can do whatever he wants. Like, if I was a student in his class, I'd be pissed off about it. I wouldn't like it, but it's all relative. So what the hell, right? So uh, yeah, I, I don't like that either, Chris. Uh, but here, here's the point too about relativism. I think no one really is a relativist in practice. We all think we are. You know, when I asked that question earlier, Everybody just jumped right in and they were like, I'm a relativist, I'm relativist, relative, relative. You're not a relativist. You are in theory. Like when you think about it, you're like, yeah, it's all just relative. But if someone murdered your friend, you'd get pretty angry and you'd think that they were wrong and that they deserve to be punished, right? Wouldn't you? I hope if you don't feel that way, um, I'm going to tell your friend on you. <laughs> like, I, I don't I mean, think like if, if I'm um, yeah. sorry to tell you off. I don't think like um, if we said that we're, if I said, we, the whole class said it, but speaking for myself, if we said we're relative, I don't think I'm understanding what it right. is then. Right. Well, it's, it's a, it's a theory that states that there's no right answer when it comes to morality. And if you see that the problem with it, I think it's, 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 it's a meta ethical theory. Yeah, so if I would have said yeah. objective, I would think there's a right, there could yeah. be a right answer and right, there could right. be wrong. Yes. Okay, well then I, yes, I do not think I'm a relative then. I was okay. not understanding what the difference was until right. now. I do okay. not think everything is like, Okay. that's not, cool. okay, I get that now. Yeah, see, and I think some people are, they're not, I don't think, I think they think they're relativist, even when they understand the difference, they think they're relativist, but they're not. They, at least they don't act like a relativist. They don't act that way. They act like, look, they did something bad. You know, they get they get mad when people screw them over. They get mad. They get mad when when people don't even screw them over. When they watch a movie and the villain screws somebody over, they get mad at the bad guy. They're like, I don't like that bad guy. He's a jerk. You know, it's like they have a sense of morality. They have a sense of right or wrong, and so. Um, I don't think anyone really is relativist in practice. I don't know what that would even look like. Like, how would you put it into practice when you have no, you've got no, no standard for right and wrong at all, then there's no way to apply the theory to anything. So when we look at all these different, you know, problems like abortion or euthanasia or all these other ethical issues, the relativist has nothing to say. They're going to say, well, it just depends. Depends on what you feel. There's really no right. There's no standard. Right. Uh, but again, I, I think that in practice, no one really acts that way. Right. But um, anyway, I think we're, we're like getting pretty close to the end of class, if not already like like done. Yeah, it's like I'm like two minutes over. I'm sorry for keeping you guys all late and everything. But um, 
I don't think, did anybody show up after uh, I was already lecturing? I don't think so. I, I got everybody here that's that's logged in. I've got you uh, counted present. So, um, so again, sorry for keeping you late. You're free to log out. If you want to stick around and ask me any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the meeting open here for just a little bit longer. Uh, but otherwise, just go ahead and do that. Uh, try to get started on the Aristotle reading. Get through as much of Aristotle as you can. And we might do a little bit more uh, relativism uh, at the beginning of class next time just to review but i want to spend most of the time on on aristotle and virtue ethics so um i guess have a good couple days and, and i'll see you wednesday um, i kind of knew i wasn't oh, what I, oh, I kind of knew i wasn't a relative in yeah. practice because like i mean yeah the way i was raised um i always grew up to like know what's right and wrong but I mean, I feel like I'm kind of like the objective side. Yeah, right. I just don't know how to explain myself yet yeah. correctly. So I don't want to say, like, I don't want to like say it in front of the class and not be able to back up, back it up. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get better at this throughout the semester. And once yeah. we look at, once we look at different arguments and different theories, you'll have a better ability to like articulate your reasoning and, and and maybe why you might reject some others and it's okay to be wrong you know it's okay to like like i've definitely changed i mean i've, I've definitely changed my views since i started doing philosophy right there's things that i used to like really strongly hold and now i'm kind of like no nah, that's probably wrong you know and so that's fine you know don't be shy right i'll try to be nice <laughs> no it's just i don't want to sound like ignorant yeah to, i don't know but yeah but yeah i mean what i would say is that like if you have a uh something you believe you know like i think this is true or whatever i want to hear it but like also just think about you don't have to come up with an argument per se it doesn't necessarily have to be like some premise one premise two or whatever but just think of like one reason why you might think that or maybe an example like maybe like a, a an example from your life like hey this happened and my friend did this and kind of like when they acted that way i didn't like it or i did like it or whatever and so you know just some background and we can kind of flesh it out it's probably the yeah. best way to approach it okay so yeah. good good Cool. All right. I think we're going to have fun this semester. I'm, I'm going to close the group uh, chat unless you guys are. Nope. No one else. All right. Thanks, Carissa. See you next time.